I'd like to work with all fathers here today. But unfortunately today in our world and sometimes in our church, there are children who do not have fathers. And uh, sad. But there's one thing that we all have in common. That believe in Jesus, we have a heavenly Father that's willing to lead our lives and guide us to follow us through. And a lot of times we forget that. I just want to remind us of that. Our fathers, we come before you today. I just want to lift us up, lift up the fathers in our church and in our community and in our world, because there are many fathers who step away from their families and leave their children abandoned. We just pray that you will help them and help us to leave this world and our community in a better place than we found it, which at this time, Lord, I don't know about it. I just want to pray for David as he can force now to lead us in this service that you will put the words on his heart to lead us. I just want to pray these things in my name. Amen. Amen. Here they go. And it's a wonderful sound. If your church ever loses that sound, you're in great trouble. All right. Let's talk about husbands of only one wife, the role of fathers in marriage, and also the role of deacons. Remember we said we were going to talk about deacons this month, uh, but this is a perfect Sunday to talk about uh, the deacons' role model and example of family. And so we're going to talk about some things. I want to just lay it out for you today. Uh, the sacrificial service that fathers do uh, based on love. And as you look at these, a husband and a father, you will be called on to do things that God normally is the only one is capable of doing. And that is to sacrificially serve a creation that does not deserve it. We do not deserve all the things that God does for us the way He blesses us. And so we're called upon to reflect what God is like to our spouse and to our children as we learn to set aside all selfishness. And this is definitely against human nature. Uh, as you think about what a lot of dads are planning on doing this afternoon, uh, there are some kind of selfish things we may have in mind about what we're going to eat, or what we're going to do or not do. And, you know, maybe there's a nap that's coming. And we finally say, now after doing all the things I've done for y'all all this year, today I'm going to do this. And it's sort of like something for me kind of thing. Uh, if that's the way it is, God bless you. Because these days it's much more common for fathers to be doing what they want to do for themselves all year long. Uh, with little thought to their families. And so uh, I, I pray God's blessing on your efforts this afternoon to chill out as dad. But it is against human nature. And so we have to think about this being a work of the Holy Spirit in us to love sacrificially through us. You see, when we're, when we're sacrificing, when we're loving in this way, that's when we're showing that we're the most like God. It's Christ-like. Jesus did not come to do a bunch of things for himself. What did he do for himself in his ministry? You think about that. It was self-sacrifice on our behalf. Now, when we do sacrificial things, it's important for us to not do it as martyrs. Oh, the things I do for y'all, you treat me like an ATM machine. Dad, money, dad, money, dad, money. Okay? Now, we can get to be a real martyr about the whole thing, and yet God doesn't do that either. Some of us would ask, what well, am I being taken advantage of? 
if we do things as unto the Lord, as the scripture talks about, we're not being taken advantage of because, in fact, it's a gift of service that they may not understand until they find themselves in similar roles later in life. But as a result of the things that you do, you experience God by being like Him, by serving in your marriage and by serving as a father in the same way that He has been serving you all of your life. And so as you think about that service, it's the goal not to be taken advantage of, but to be a servant. And so, uh, I want to tell you a, a bit of a story. Some of you have heard this before, and I want to get it right. So I'm going to I'm going to read this to you. It's about two families. Uh, the one family is uh, the family of a fellow named Max Jukes. The other one is the family of a fellow named Jonathan Edwards. Now, this is a long time ago that this happened in our nation. That in New York, they decided to do a study of these families and to follow the family members through the history to see the difference between these families. It says that Max Jukes was an unbelieving man, married a woman of like character who lacked principle. And among the known descendants, over 1,200 of Max Jukes' descendants were studied. It says that uh, from these, uh, 310 became professional vagrants. Uh, for y'all, that's bums. <laughs> 440 physically wrecked their lives by living a debauched lifestyle. 130 were sent to the penitentiary uh, for an average of 13 years each. Seven of them for murder. There were over 100 who became alcoholics, 60 who were habitual thieves, 190 public prostitutes, and the 20 who learned to trade, 10 of them learned to trade in a state prison. It cost the state, now this was a long time ago, about a million five hundred thousand dollars on this family to do all these things with them over the years. And they made no contribution whatever to society that could be found. On the other hand, a contemporary, uh, Jonathan Edwards, the same era, uh, he uh, was a, a pastor. Uh, he was a man of God, married a woman of like character. And their family began, they became a part of this study also. 300 became clergymen, missionaries, and theological professors. Over 100 became college professors. Over 100 became attorneys. See, you do have some that go off. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All right, 30 of them judges, 60 of them physicians, 60 became authors of good classics, good books, 14 became presidents of universities. There were numerous giants in American industry that emerged from this family. Three became United States congressmen, and one became vice president of the United States. You got a couple other guys that got off there at the end. <laughs> now the fact of the matter is, is that what we do as fathers, how we live, the role model we are, is important in the lives of our kids. It sets a course. It has a, a framework, a structure that they understand what is acceptable and what is important in the home. Today, in your Cypress Heart, there's a, a piece in here about fatherhood. And guys, if you would take that uh, sometime and, and look at the back, if you want to take something home that you can work on through this year, and you can say, you know, what are some things that I can do to be a dad as far as God is concerned according to His Word? Uh, this will be very helpful. It talks about a father being a leader, a priest, a teacher, and a lover of parts of his kids and grandkids and that sort of thing. Very good piece and I want you to be aware of it. Now let's look, if we would, at some scripture passages that are connected to 
what we just told you about the idea of Mr. Jews and Mr. Edwards. It's not a normal passage, probably for Father's Day, but let's look at James chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. You see, one of the critical issues is what your children hear from you as a priority. If what they hear from you is good and positive and helpful, even under the category of discipline and correction, that's going to be useful. But the tongue is restless evil, full of deadly poison. Why? With it we bless the Lord our, and our Lord and Father. With it we curse men. The same mouth been made in the likeness of God, we're cursing these people from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. No, it shouldn't be this way. So, as a father, what we're looking at is a consistent witness to what God is like by what comes from our mouths. The word of our mouth and how we speak, how we reflect with our children the things of God. In verse 11, it expands on this idea of a fountain. And you don't have salt water and fresh water coming from the same fountain. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. So as we deal with children, as we deal with grandchildren, guys, we have this responsibility to give evidence of the presence of God in our life by the behavior, by the deeds by the gentleness, by the wisdom that only God can place there. Verse 14. He gives us the opposite. So, if inside of you, in your home, in your family, in your marriage, in your relationship, if what is seen there is bitter jealousy, selfish ambition in your heart, then you're going to be going against the truth of the Word of God arrogantly living in such a way that you are defying the truth of what Scripture has said. You see, God's wisdom is one thing. Then there's a worldly wisdom, and they're not the same. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, this ambitious, selfish, clinging, trying to accomplish your own thing. That kind of wisdom is earthly, it's natural, it's demonic. For where you see the evidence of that, See, people can be really wise to manipulate and, and try to get people to do what they want them to do. That's not from God. So where you see jealousy, where you see selfish ambition existing, and this, there's disorder in every evil thing, then now you know what kind of framework, structure, and wisdom is going on in the life of that father and in that couple 